Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to today's episode. We're going to be talking all about uh, pain and pain science. This is something that there's kind of a lot of controversy around. There's a lot of misunderstanding around this. And so um, I actually invited uh, Dr. Raymond San Agustin back on the show. Uh, previously, we talked about getting lifters out of pain, but then thought it would be pertinent to actually record a follow-up episode just discussing pain in a little bit more um, depth. And so first off, thanks for coming back on the show. It's good to have you here, man. Thank you for having me. It's always fun. So um, why don't we, I guess, just couch the discussion in um, kind of classifying what pain is, and then we can kind of go into like previously um, held beliefs around pain and then how that's transitioned and sort of evolved over time into the current BPS model and what direction you think that's going in as well. Um, okay, cool. I think we talked about this last time too. And in the definition of pain is the uncomfortable experience from um, potential or actual tissue damage. And then we kind of like diverted and, were, and discussed whether or not <clears throat> What's the difference between pain and injury? And is there an overlap or is there not? And um, it had me thinking, I was like, I wonder if there's like an actual definition for um, injury. And it was just like, yeah, if that there's some sort of loss. And that was kind of what I was going about last time is there's a loss of function or there's a loss of um, something that is otherwise meaningful for someone. And, and I think that's like still my my best put forward in terms of what uh, injury is. So pain, and by no means am I an expert on this, but I find having, being equipped with something to explain to patients on a day-to-day -day basis is, is important, <clears throat> especially whether it's chronic pain or like they're athletes and just trying to figure out or navigating why something's a little more sore than others or why um, they can't quite get into their regular training habits. Um, and just telling them it's about sensitivity. It's just whether or not that part of the body is telling you to chill out either because your capacity is lower than usual because you're sleeping like shit, eating like shit, or you're stressed out. And like, there's a lot of factors that are coming into place. Sometimes it's just your volume capacity isn't quite there yet. And you're just going over that threshold or sometimes your, your intensity capacity isn't quite there yet and you're going over that because your mean intensity over your training block is a little bit higher um there's so many factors and and kind of like asking the right questions for your patient or your your client rather um is going to be the most important thing like really because you got to figure out why that's happening yeah and so i guess uh, previously, and this is still, I think, fairly deeply couched um, uh, sort of idea of this mechanistic uh, biophysical type of pain and, and sensory input. And so um, a great example of this would be like a disc herniation. So I wrote an article on this a while back. Um, and I remember when I was looking at a lot of the research on back injuries, um, I was actually really surprised, uh, at, at what I found. So, you know, just looking at the kind of mechanisms for injury, but then looking at how many people have, or like, uh, I guess, present with those mechanisms, but then have no uh, experience of pain whatsoever. Like, I can't remember the exact figures off the top of my head, but something like 19 to 23% of all people with, uh, posterior disc herniations present with no symptoms or, or something to that effect. So don't necessarily get yeah. on that, but like, it's, it's a pretty significant figure, you know, and then like 66.66% of all herniations have spontaneous reabsorption and yeah. you're like, wait, what? <laughs> and then like people with MRI imaging, like some people present with significant pain and they get imaging and there's no tissue damage at least that's detectable anyways, I'll say, um, yeah. which is again, really interesting. And so that kind of, I, I don't exactly know when the BPS model really um, was introduced 
initially. I know that I'd say probably within the last 10 years, at least as far as I'm aware, that's kind of when it started to gain a whole lot more traction. Um, but uh, yeah, so typically that was kind of like the older model, the, the biophysical or biomedical model, I believe is, is yeah. you know, some people call it. Yeah. Um, where it's like, you know, you hurt your leg because there's a cut, you know, you, you tore a tissue and now there's, now you're experiencing pain. Whereas now it's a little bit more complex than that. Like you said, you know, and even individual tolerance to pain, right? Because let's say two people experience the same injury is their pain experience the same, you know? Um, I don't know. So that's, that's a pretty kind of interesting, uh, I guess, rabbit hole to go down. So feel free to kind of. <laughs> well, with the disc injury one, especially spontaneous reabsorption or like um, recovery from a disc herniation, it, like I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the prognosis, like you're more likely to get better if the disc herniation is worse. Like for whatever reason, like if it's a complete sequestration, we're like, that's, that's like, it like blew up and you don't have to do surgical um, intervention for that. Like there's no inflammatory issues or anything like that where the spinal cord's affected. For whatever reason, they actually improve much better than someone with herniations that like aren't complete and they're smaller and they're just kind of like nagging. And so then it, I think what happened is people started to ask those questions or like, okay, well, well then what's going on if something that would be technically more injurious with tissue damage, you would think that it would be a worse prognosis, but for whatever reason, when it's a smaller herniation and they don't get better within that like three month period where that's for some reason, spontaneous reabsorption kind of happens. Um, people are still getting nagging back injuries or like nagging, a uh, nagging back pain. So, so then you wonder like, what are the, this is where the BPS model kind of makes sense is they've been told this, like they have this thing and it's instead of um, a lot of patients we meet, instead of teaching them tools to kind of either mitigate flare ups or work around it in the meantime, they're told that they can't do this. They can't do that. And so then it builds more anxiety and it builds more um, uh, disempowerment and they, they don't feel like they have control of what their body is capable of. It withdraws them from their social networks, whether it's like from their powerlifting team or their sport or whatever the case may be. And because of those things, those are going to perpetuate pain too, because now you got anxiety and that's going to make you more sensitized just because you're more, you're anxious about it. You're something that's out of your control. Now you're not with your normal social group and you lose that little bit of support or that feeling of connection, or now you're no longer doing meaningful activities that like you really, really love. And those are things that are just going to perpetuate the sensitivity of the, the individual and and maybe that's why, like, maybe that's actually why, like, it's not the actual tissue is herniated and that's why we're unadaptable or, and you can't quite get into those positions again, because you're afraid of them. And then that's really what's actually happening is that your brain or your nervous system is so ramped up to protect those positions that that's maybe where the pain is coming from. It's like no longer actual tissue that's the pain generator. Maybe it is like, obviously there's like a spectrum of it, but um, I would start to think more along those lines is like, is it still the tissue that's being the, the main generator of pain? Or is it like, is it the social construct of it? Like maybe they're just afraid of that movement. So that potential tissue damage is worrisome. So then their body's like, no, don't go there. I'm going to send a, a, like a painful stimulus and, um, and then they're just going to be like, yeah, that hurts anytime I bend over because I can't bend over. I have a disc herniation. You know, like, it's just, it's so strange because some people, like you said, can have them and they'll never have the symptomatology. Yeah. And I mean, like, that's a pretty powerful aspect too, is the whole nocebo effect, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you expect something to happen and, sort of ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy and like there's a lot of really cool research on like um 
uh, orthopedic surgeries. I'm sure you're probably familiar with that where they do like sham surgeries. And uh, so, so essentially if anyone who doesn't know what a sham surgery is, basically they, they just pretend to perform a surgery on someone. Uh, so they, you know, go through the whole procedure, they, you know, slice you open, but then they don't actually perform the surgery and then they just suture you up or whatever it might be. And they tell you that you got the surgery and that actually tends to perform basically just as well as the actual surgery for it within the context of, you know, that research, whatever, for, for certain orthopedic surgeries, which is really interesting because it's like, that doesn't mean that the surgeries are ineffective because there are certain people who wouldn't experience a beneficial effect from placebo alone, but then it also does show that placebo itself is a pretty powerful, um, I guess, remedy. I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it has a pretty powerful effect. And then the reverse is also true where you tell someone that they're ill and all of a sudden they fall ill. And there, there's a whole kind of like literature on those things as well, but it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Like the, the power of, of expectation, you know, like even you just go into a clinician, like it, you know, when I go and see you, uh, so for those who, who are just kind of listening, um, uh, I, I'm based out of Calgary right now, and and so is Ray. So his clinic is is out of Calgary as well. So I go to see you. There is some sort of expectation, like, hey, I'm going to go there. He's going to figure it out, and we're going to feel better, <laughs> you know. And and that alone just sort of like is a little bit of a an anxiolytic effect, you know. For sure, absolutely. Because it's just like. It, yeah, it just kind of makes you feel or makes me feel a little bit better because I'm like, okay, I'm getting this treated. And then I, I, one thing that I'm kind of curious about actually, um, and I don't know if there is anything on this or if you have any sort of opinion on this, but I would be interested to know differences in pain experience between people of different temperaments. So hmm. um, I guess if I'm just going to be really crude about it, there are certain people who are just pretty gritty and tough. And there are certain people who are just little bitches. <laughs> and, and I wonder if the pain experience is actually any different or if their tolerance is just higher or, you know what I mean? Like I, I would really I totally know what you mean yes. differences between those two things. And I would like to know how that actually impacts that sort of stuff. Like, because that is kind of part of the psychological and the social component as well like i mean when i was growing up like my family and the neighborhoods that we lived in were pretty pretty rough <laughs> you know <laughs> and so like if if you get into some shit like that's just it like i remember i got jumped and i got slashed real bad with a knife one time and like i just went home and um got sutured up at my house like there was no going to the hospital we didn't really have like couldn't afford it you know what i mean so so it's yeah. very I don't know. I just wonder how that changes from person to person. I would be super interested in learning about that because I have no clue. <clears throat> you should take this course, actually. Um, Greg Lehman, he's a Canadian Cairo physio. Oh, yeah, I know Greg Lehman. Yeah, yeah. He, um, I don't know the course, he though. He talks so. about this. It's called, uh, it, it's, it, there's an online one that's really awesome. And then he, he hosts them in different places. I don't know if he's coming to Calgary, but um, his online one was awesome because that he draws that parallel of like, people who are just tough and people who are little bitches is he says it a little bit different. He calls them endurance <laughs> copers. <Yeah. laughs> he calls them endurance copers and then avoidant copers. There are people who are very fearful. They're usually the ones that, that probably need to be pushed into the direction of like loading towards processes of discomfort. And then there are uh, like endurance copers who will just kind of like bite on a wooden spoon and just kind of keep going, even though they, they're, you're, you're just perpetuating that pain message. And the, the thing about the nervous system is it gets really efficient. And uh, if, if it gets really efficient at sending a pain message, this is kind of like going into Butler's stuff. Like you're creating, I don't know if it's a memory is the right way to describe it, but you're, they call it neuro tags. It's like, you're creating, um, you're reinforcing a painful message out of a position because you're you're constantly doing it you're just like not giving the nervous system time to desensitize from those either positions or loads or whatever the case may be and um <clears throat> those are usually people you gotta be like just chill out man like take it easy we'll come back to it let's figure out a way to load elsewhere like elsewhere and i find most sports like 
certain sports have more endurance copers and then most actually most athletes in general are, are usually endurance copers. Like they're the ones that, that you have to tell them to just chill out for a bit. Let's figure out another way to do something so that you don't have to keep getting injured or you don't have to keep loading this tissue where you're basically, you might be decreasing your capacity because you're just reinforcing this pain message. And then I would say there's definitely personality types that are uh, avoidant copers, but I wish there was like, like you said, there was like a survey. I wish I could send a survey to all my patients. I could fill it out and it would score them based on if they were an endurance coper or an avoidant coper. Cause then it would make my job way easier. Cause I could just, I'd be like, Nope, we're doing this. You're going to have to buck up or no, let's pull back and kind of do that. It would just be easy to classify people that simply, but it's not quite that easy all the time. Yeah. And I mean, that makes sense. The idea that, you know, a decent percentage of, of athletes would kind of present more as uh, an endurance coper as you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, just because obviously you do have to, ha- there, there's probably a little bit of a, like a survivorship bias where, you know, if you do want to actually excel at a sport, you do have to grind through things. You do have to become, you know, develop a certain level of like mental toughness, dedication, competency, and all these things. So it, it doesn't seem like those would necessarily be separated out. So I can definitely see that being the case. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. I guess when, well, I guess it sort of comes back to, to coaching then, right? Like the, the whole client centered uh, approach, like it's so funny because when I'm talking to um, certain people, like, because I'm big, because I'm a power lifter and because I have tattoos everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, like I just, I just don't necessarily want to be coached by someone who's just going to like yell at me and have like the tough love. I'm like, what? Like, you don't know anything about me. Like, why would you say yeah. that? And I get it. I get it. Right. Cause that's kind of what's perpetuated by the fitness industry. So, so I get that. But then at the same time, it's like, I've literally had, and this has happened quite a few times where I've literally had people, um, I'll do a check-in and they'll send me like back a response. And they're just like, wow, like, I like, thank you so much. Like, I I totally didn't think that I thought you were going to yell at me or something like that. Like, but that was actually really helpful. I really appreciate being so understanding and And I'm like, I'm here to get you better. So like, whatever is required to get you better. Sometimes, yes, that is going to be me being saying like, just shut the fuck up and get under the bar. Like I've got, I've got a couple athletes that I've, I mean, I have a pretty good relationship with most of my athletes. Uh, But there's a couple who are here, like we're local that are actually friends of mine. And like, especially for them, you know, like there are times where I will say like, shut the fuck up and get under that and like actually get in their face about it because that's how I get them to perform well. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not just me wanting to be emotional. That's like, actually, I know how to get them to perform. Then I have other athletes where I have to take the polar opposite approach and there's everything in between, but that's kind of like, actually, you know what? I'll be honest. I, I don't think I've ever sworn at anyone. (laughs) <laughs> but like the, the, I guess that mentality though, just like, you know, really getting in their face about it and being like, Hey, it's time to fucking step up. Like, are you ready to do this? You know, just like, yeah, in face about this, but, yeah. um, but yeah. And, uh, and so I don't know, it's just kind of funny, like how different temperaments kind of require different strategies to actually get that outcome. And I would suspect, I guess, that that's probably similar in terms of like the treatment protocol, like you were saying, where some people need to be pushed a little harder. Some people need to be kind of, uh, you know, handheld a little bit longer. For sure. And I like, even at the clinic, for example, like there are clinicians in our, in our facility who are just like way more there. They will for sure be the one to tell you when you just, you got to buck up. I'm not really one of those people. I'm like very soft spirited human being. Um, and uh, I, I usually just try, everyone says it's bedside manner, like, but it's like, sometimes you want to say that, but I don't know how, how this person is going to react. If I say, you know, you're just being a baby. I would love to say that to some people, but um, cause sometimes that's the thing that they need to hear, but that takes time. Like you're saying, you're not going to say that to your athlete that you've been training for like three weeks right and like ideally i don't want a patient 
uh, to see me for years, like maybe pop up every once in a while, but I don't want the like the goal is to not for them to not see me anymore. So like that relationship doesn't always get, we just don't have time to develop that relationship all the time. Cause hopefully you're getting better by like visit three, visit four. And then we kind of just push you out to monitor it. Or I work with your coach and your coach is the one to do that because coaches really, they develop a much stronger connection with their uh, clients than we ever do as clinicians. Um, even though it's part of the process, like it's just time. Like it just, you need, you need those reps and I'm not going to be the one to tell you to come once a week, every week for a year. Like that doesn't make sense unless, unless you want to, and you don't want to do your rehab and you have a ton of money to blow. And like, I will, <laughs> I will work on, we can always make things harder. That's the nice part is I could always make things harder, but um, most people generally just don't need that or like they don't have um, access to that. Yeah, no, for sure. And so I guess I kind of want to go back to, to talking about um, back pain uh, again a little bit, because like spinal flexion is still something that's pretty controversial, uh, especially loaded, um, loaded spinal flexion, extension, rotation, things like that. Um, and understandably so. And I, like, I do think that there is a, you know, a mechanism there for sure, but I also think that it sort of depends on context because like, I know that for myself, for instance, um, and this is sort of like just full disclosure, this is like an N equals one kind of thing where this was my experience where I, I had a very serious back injury and I was like wearing a back brace and crutches for like 10, 11 months. And uh, my, like the specialists that I was seeing, they were like, so I was seeing a sports med doc, I was seeing a physio um, and I got like some imaging done or whatever my back, my SI, like I was, it was really fucked up. There was a lot of damage done. Um, and I remember going to my physio and I was just like, this isn't enough. Like you're getting me to stand on a BOSU ball. And they're like, well, we need to develop stability. And I'm like, yeah, but like, okay, that's fine. But like at the time my squat was still pretty good. And so squatting on a BOSU ball is not going to do shit for me, you know, in terms of like the magnitude of stimulus. And I remember I did that for months because I was legitimately scared that I wasn't going to be able to lift again. So I was just like, okay, I'm going to put my faith in the, in the experts and, and listen to them. And I did that for a long time. And then I remember um, after a while, like, I was just like, man, I just can't handle this anymore. So I stopped and I was just like, I'm just going to do this myself. And I started doing uh, Ukrainian deadlifts with a barbell. So for those of you who don't know what the Ukrainian deadlift is, basically you stand on, um, you stand on something and then you do a deadlift, but you really, really flex your low back, well, your entire back, basically. So I was standing kind on like a huge, huh? kind of like a Jefferson curl. Uh, the Jefferson curl. Is that the one where you're, you're like curling down? Yeah. 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 yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the Ukrainian deadlift, the difference is that you're standing on two side things and then you have like holding like a kettlebell, like a heavy kettlebell. Yeah. I think the Jefferson, yeah. So I guess this is more of a Jefferson uh, deadlift then. But I was standing on like a six or six or eight inch um, uh, block, and then doing that with like just an empty barbell was even like too much for me. So I had to have like two, two five pound dumbbells, and I was doing that, and I was like shaking. But then after a while, I got up to seventy kilos, and then a hundred kilos, and I was actually working up to like three fifty, four hundred pounds, like major spinal flexion. Which again, not recommending that to anyone. But I was fully like back to normal within, I want to say six to eight weeks, like lifting Sweet. all my normal weights. And now I actually program that for myself because I just feel really, really good when I do that, you know, and I don't do it with that much load because I usually do it after my actual deadlift. So I usually do it with like maybe anywhere between like a hundred kilos and like 180 kilos, something like that. That's really impressive. Um, <laughs> but like, but that just feels really good to me. You know, and like, I also think that there's something to be said about like being able to, I guess, sort of have that awareness of like, am I in a compromised position? And I feel like because I took a very, very long time to sort of build up to those things, now my tissues and all that stuff, I just feel very strong, very secure, very stable in those positions. Whereas I would never do that from the get go. Like, there has to be a runway of, of kind of progression there. But then at the same time, I see people who, incredibly strong but they don't have a lot of positional tolerance in like i guess a variety of different ways 
And then all of a sudden they get injured. And a great example of that would be when I tore my oblique, uh, when I, you know, went to throw a punch when I just started boxing again. Yeah. Right? And so, um, but, but then there's also like a lot of, uh, variability in that too, because like, if you look at rowers, cyclers, football players, all these people, you're getting huge amounts of compressive force and repeated flexion extension moments. Um, and then especially for football, like that's incredibly high impact, like two, 300 pound dudes smashing. Yeah. Yeah. No one's, so so, but they don't really present with any higher risk of injury or anything like that. And so other than brain injury, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah. I, I meant, I meant back in. I know I'm just joking. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's a really important distinction. <laughs> um, but, but that just kind of, again, throws another wrench in, in, in the wheel where it's like, you know, okay, well, what actually is the mechanism? Because I do still fully believe that. Yeah. Like probably loaded spinal flexion is, is a mechanism. I, I do believe that, but I also think that there's a lot more that, kind of determines whether or not that's going to be a potential risk factor for individual A versus B versus C, you know? And so what are your thoughts on that? So what we normally, like when I teach um, our clinicians, like I, I like to say, I'm like, just classify people in their intolerances. So like if someone has a flexion intolerance, they're just basically, they don't like it. So that's going to be thing, the thing that sensitizes the structure that's causing pain. So you, you know what you do? You just, you avoid it for a while and then you slowly load them. And that was probably what you were doing. That's exactly what you were doing. And you're progressive overload over a long period of time with a lot of consistency, the tissue is going to have to buttress the area and lay down new tissue. Like that's just Davis's law of soft tissue. Like it has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, you will probably either not get stronger or you're going to be in pain because the area will get sensitized because it's not able to heal. And then there's like extension tolerances. Like people just don't like being in extension for whether it's repetitions or loads. Like that's just usually how we classify them. We don't say like, oh, this is for sure a disc because we don't know that. And even if it was a disc injury, like it, it's not going to change how we modify your rehab. It's progression of, of like and graded progression of overload and and graded exposure to the pain, like the, the ranges of motion and the position. So I feel like a lot of people are, they want to be classified so often because it gives meaning in, in just making sense of it. But that's where I, I think it's almost disempowering because like you should just focus on what you can do. Like, let's just focus on what we can do. And like, if what you're doing can be loaded more or made difficult, it's worth it. Like that's cause like a BOSU ball, what the fuck are you going to do? Like you're just going to put another BOSU ball underneath and then we're going to put another BOSU ball underneath or now we're waiting it. Like why? Like it doesn't make sense to treat or create stability by putting you on something in, unstable. Like that's the, that's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense, but <clears throat> And then you've just figured it out on your own. You're like, I have a flexion intolerance. Let's, it doesn't hurt when it's unweighted. So let's do that. And you just progressively go over like make It makes sense because as long as, as long as the person can adapt to it, you give it enough time. I don't see why it would be a bad thing either. Cause even when we do hip flexion, like your spine still has to flex anyways. So why is it something that we should demonize or, or create fear around? Cause you're going to flex whether you want to or not. It might not even look like it, but it's happening because it might not look like it because your back is straight, but naturally our backs are in lordosis or like there's a curve. So uh, it seems it's, it seems silly to just tell someone that they can't do that because then they'll get cancer or something like it doesn't make sense. It's, just, it's nonsense. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely like, it's interesting what you were saying about like the whole diagnostic process, because on the one hand, like I definitely see where someone is coming from in terms of wanting some sort of plausible rationale for like, why am I in pain? Like, and, and having it make sense to them, I think is a really, really important part. But then at the same time, 
you know, if that individual sort of internalizes it exactly like you were saying, you know, oh, I have a disc, I have a disc herniation, so I can't do A, B, and C. And it's like, okay, well now, now it's becoming problematic. And so do you, I guess it sounds like, and I, I want to make sure I understand this correctly. It sounds like for most people, you, rather than talking about what the injury is, you'll be like, this is kind of what I think it might be, but that's not really relevant because here's exactly. how we're going to approach it. And here's why we're approaching it like that. And here's why, regardless of if it's this, this, or this, it doesn't matter because we're going to take the same approach anyways. Yep. That's exactly what I say. Like even shoulder injuries now, <clears throat> um, we were like, Oh, I have a shoulder impingement. And I was like, okay, that means so many different things. Like that yeah. just basically means you have pain in the front shoulder. Of the shoulder. Pain. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you know how many things are attached at that point? Like, there's the subscap tendon. There's a, a supraspinatus tendon. There's like the lat tendons not far off either. And then there's like a bursa sac there. And then there's like an AC joint. And, and really all it is, is just sensitive tissue that are just it, like, it's just, that's it. It's just sensitive tissue. And usually what I'll say is like, well, okay, it could be a subscap tendon or it could be like a, just a strain in the muscle, but really it doesn't matter because the only thing that will change based off that information is either how long it's going to take to heal because muscles just heal much faster than tendons do. Um, but it doesn't change what we're going to do is going to be slowly progressing the movements, give them an opportunity to figure out other tissues that they can also load in those positions and modify it as best they can and show them that it is modifiable and that it's not, it doesn't have to hurt if you do a, a, maybe a little bit different way in the meantime, or, and then slowly go back to the old way you do it, or maybe this is still better for you. Who knows? Yeah. And I, I think like, so I remember personally, when I first started hearing about some of this stuff, I was a little bit skeptical. Sorry, Daniel, I think you're muted. Oh, can you, can you hear me? Uh, give me a second here. Hmm. Okay, let's try that. Again. Can you talk? Can you hear me now? Okay, sweet. Good. Here we go. Sorry. Go for it. All right, cool. You can hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, like I remember when I first heard, I can't remember who it was, but I, I was watching a lecture and uh, essentially they said the same thing. They were like, yeah, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter what specifically it is because we're going to treat it the same way. And to me, I was thinking like, cause again, I tend to be one of those people who sort of obsesses over details. And I was like, okay, well, like if, if there's an issue with your engine and this might be a terrible example because I know nothing about cars, but let's, it's like, is it the spark plug or do you have a gas leak or, you know what I mean? So I'm like, that matters. Right. But then, For sure. And so like, I asked the question and then he was like, okay, well, let's look at it this way, you know, flex your Terry's minor. And I was like, uh, okay. And I was like, I, I can't. He's like, okay, can you flex your supraspinatus or subscap? And I was like, no. And, and he's like, okay, why not? And I was like, well, cause everything else is going to fire on. And he's like, okay, so is it really that important that we, you know, specifically isolate which muscle it is or, you know, is it more important that we look at the coordinated like movement of what's actually going on and, and exactly. you know, which positions actually cause you issues. And then we just train those positions because whatever is in control of those positions and stabilizing and generating the movement and blah, blah, blah is going to be strengthened and reinforced and stuff like that. And I was like, Oh, okay. That kind of makes sense because yeah, at first when you hear that, when it's like, it doesn't really matter what it is. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, what are you a quack? But then when you think about it more and more and more, you're like, oh, okay, like that does sort of make sense, you know? Um, can you talk a little bit about positional tolerance though? Um, you know, like a, an example sometimes that I use is again, like me tearing my oblique. So my squat is my best lift by far. So I clearly don't have weak obliques. Yeah. Yet I threw a punch after not having boxed for like 10 years and it was like, it wasn't even hard. It was just moving fast. And all of a sudden, boom, just tore my oblique, you know? And, and so 
Um, that kind of speaks a little bit to positional tolerance, but can you kind of, I guess, go over that with some of the people? I think like, <clears throat> so positional tolerance, it, it's, this is where it kind of gets into the nitty gritty too. Cause like um, something might be very, very good at um, loading in an eccentric force or much better at a, in with speed rather than with like, str- like, tension for example like uh, back squat we know you could your tissue is strong enough to deal with a lot of force in a deadlift or back squat or even like a bench press but it becomes a different type of force when you're throwing it and then there's a resistance that's meeting that exact same force with speed now because most of the time you guys are lifting at a slow rate, unless you're doing, you're on like a speed block where you're kind of just repping it out. Right. So you were peaking for uh, nationals or what was yeah. it for? Yeah. yeah. So I, you're probably not on a speed block where you're doing faster movements. So your tissue is not adapted to those positions with the speed that's involved. And it's just like a huge movement. You can't really like, it, the way you train for it is by punching. Like that's just kind of how it goes. So, yeah. so now you, you've put yourself in a, a state that you just haven't been adapted to quite yet. And the tissue just kind of like, it was just like, Nope, that's not what we do here. Um, I'm going to stop this before it gets any worse and then go from there. And also like, cause you're peaking for nationals, if we were to use the biopsychosocial model a little bit more, you should, everyone should kind of like dive in when it matters. You're like, you're probably nervous. Cause you're like, I injured myself. Now I have nationals coming up. That's going to make things more sensitive. Like it's just part of the process. Your brain and your nervous system is going to prioritize this because you have a goal that's set in mind and now you can't achieve it or like now there might be something impeding it so it's going to make it more important in your brain to like pull you back and um so there's that part of it as well like that's like another layer that you just kind of have to address and the thing that's nice is i could just be like okay we're gonna load this just so that you know that it's safe to keep training and then that in itself is anxiolytic like you were saying gives you some confidence to keep training that you're not going to hurt yourself and then pain dampens it might be uncomfortable but like pain will dampen it's no longer a five it's a three or two and you're an athlete so you're likely to be able to tolerate a three or two a little bit more and you kind of like push through until until nationals happens like that's that's fine i'm okay with that that's kind of where the the goal is is to get you to the the game right Mm -hmm. so it's just it's just what you've been adapted to because like you know like everyone once a year i will try to do some break dancing that i like used to do when i was younger i'm like 80 pounds heavier than i was when i was break dancing too and it hurts but it's just because i don't do it and i put myself in a position that i just don't train that i've never used and I don't spit on my head on an everyday basis. So it's going to be a little bit sore when I do that. So it's just, it's because the nervous system's like, Hey, we've done something we don't normally do. Um, maybe back off. So I have time to adapt to it. It's just, mm-hmm. it's, um, it's creating a prioritization process. That's much more efficient than, um, than we give it credit for like we're very adaptable and resilient but you just got to give it a chance to do it we're not like we're not like cars in that regard like there's no computer handheld computer that i could plug in to tell me exactly what's wrong and then uh, just change it it's not that simple which kind of makes the whole playing with thresholds playing with capacities playing with uh the introduction of different ranges or positions that you need um in the meantime, but that's kind of where that capacity builds out is it just, it needs to be introduced slowly Mm -hmm. or maybe fast, but it has to, I, I kind of saw it on the Mike Isertel thing, like maximum recoverable volume. Like you got to toe the line to kind of for greatness. So if you push the threshold a little bit, things are going to be sore. You just know that that's where the threshold is right now in the meantime. 
Yeah. And it's kind of funny because <laughs> on the one hand, like it's, it's sort of counterintuitive that you might think that uh, like the stronger you are, the more risk of injury you have if you go outside of your sport, you know, because yeah. it's like you're, so uh, there was, a, there was a time where I was running with a girl that I was seeing and she was a runner and um, I remember she was like, oh, I'll beat you in a race or something like that. And I was like, oh, maybe, I don't know. I'm slow and I'm fat, you know? And so she started running and then I started running and I was probably running at like maybe 40% and I blew by her and then I just stopped and she kept running and she's like, oh, I win. She's like, why'd you stop? And I was like, cause I could tell that if I ran any faster, I felt like I was going to blow my hamstring off. You know? <laughs> Cause it was like, it felt like nothing like the power, even though I'm big, like my squats really good. And I do a lot of like split stance work, like Bulgarians and things like that. So, I mean, I think my power to weight ratio is still in a very productive range, but I'm not used to that ballistic transfer of force where it's like, oh, I can't remember what sprinters do but it's something like like six times or whatever their body weight ground reaction yeah. force or some crazy nonsense where I think it goes up to 10 too for some of them too yeah like just just insane amounts of like force generated into the ground in like a fraction of a second so it's like if your achilles if your knees if your hamstrings and everything is not ready to offload and then reload quickly enough and there's some sort of break in that cycle man you could be running into some issues and so i mean gosh i can't remember his name pt fitness he's like a really crazy strong dude super jacked um and he was like just messing around with some some box jumps uh, or sorry some some jumps and then he jumped over one thing and went to do a rebound jump and blew his quad tendon right oh, just like because he doesn't do it you know, he's yeah. crazy strong, crazy fit, but he just doesn't do it. And so he just wasn't prepared. And his tenants were like, nope, not having it. Um, yeah, it's, it's insane. And I think like the highest injury rate sport is actually like, sorry, like population is men in their 30s that play basketball. Because it's like, you know, like you're just playing yeah. a pickup game, big jumping, sprinting, fast cutting, all that nonsense. And then they're like, I haven't played since high school. Now I'm going to play like. You're yeah. not accommodated for those forces. You just haven't adapted to it. Like from high school to 30, most, most men are probably 30 to 40 pounds heavier than they were in high school. So then now you have like an increased force just simply because your body weight and then they haven't trained for it. And they, they think it's simple enough because it was simple. Like it's a good, it's just something that you normally played and then not realizing the tissue is just not prepared for it. Yeah, no one's gonna play for like two minutes and be like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna bench myself for you know for a little bit and then no way. Like, I'm gonna do five sets of like two minute intervals and take it easy. It's like yeah. just going going ham. And it's so funny actually that you bring that up because like I when I used to work in um this really, really big fitness club, it was like a it was world health at the time, but it was like a sports club. So they had like professional tennis players there, a whole tennis court, squash courts, Cairo physio, like outdoor pool, all this crazy stuff. And um, I remember you'd walk by and you'd see like these older guys playing squash and they had like arm braces, like knee braces, ankle braces, wrist braces. And they're just doing all this stuff. And it's like, meanwhile, they're drinking beer while they're playing. And it's like, you're just like a walking injury because they're not doing anything, but they're just going so hard, but they're not building up any, they're not like, huh, maybe I should like lift some weights or do something to make sure that I can actually play this aggressively. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's fascinating how much GPP is just discounted these days now. Like it's, like just Walking. to be able to, yeah, and tolerate at something heavier outside of your body weight. You know what I mean? Like uh, it's, it's wild. So, yeah, and like you guys are, you're at strength edge, right? So, yeah, in terms of building capacity, those strongmen, braced flexion, braced extension, where they're like, you don't just like you don't go from zero to two hundred pounds right away. They're like yeah, building up to it, right? Like, yeah. 
Yeah. You just you build up to it. You build your tolerance for it. So, and that's the thing is, it's all it's a rep game, right? You got to figure out how to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so when when it comes to training and, and pain perception, like, um, it's funny because there's like a lot of different presentations of pain. So, like, some people will train and have no pain when they're training but then they experience pain after and it's like kind of a residual pain that just kind of lasts throughout the rest of the day but then while they're training that actually makes it feel better um but then also if they continue training it kind of gets worse if that makes sense like not in the training but after yeah so that's actually indicative of like probably tendinopathy Mm -hmm. which like it's like the presentations of symptoms are usually after the fact and it, it feels better with movement. Like that's probably more so. And then, so that just means that they just need better. They got to figure out how to like load a little bit more into the muscle belly rather than the tendon, like take away some of the explosive stuff or some of the, like the capacity building or like the, sorry, the tendons role in those movements that they're doing. So that's like historical information where you're like, okay, we need to go heavy and slow right now. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's just kind of like you're taking information and changing their training based off of it. But it's, that's more so what it would be then. It'd be less so like sensitivity to the positions. It's like the tissues just pissed off because it's doing a little bit more than it should be. Yeah. And so can you just go over maybe some of the, um, I guess, potential triggers of, of pain? And obviously these aren't like ubiquitous where it's like all of these are going to be present, but like, for instance, I know, you know, velocity obviously is, is one. Um, And like even weightlifters, like weightlifters kind of have to do some eccentric loading every now and then because there's just like virtually none of that in in their training right no. um and so velocity is one obviously like range of motion is one um you know what, what are some of the other things that you know you can kind of look at a program and say hey you know they're experiencing pain but i'm noticing we never do any maybe it's volume maybe it's intensity i don't know right uh, honestly so you look at it's for sure volumes like the number one thing i think is the first thing to look at <clears throat> um and I also, I like to look at how many days they're training. So like total volume, daily volume is like the first thing that I look at because we work with a lot of CrossFitters as well. Mm-hmm. And half the time, it's just like, it's just poor volume management. Like they're just, they're fucking doing like a bunch of gymnastics and then they're doing weightlifting and then they're like, then they do fucking 200 burpees and you're just like yeah you're gonna have shoulder pain just because like there's the tissue can only tolerate so much sick cyclic load so you just gotta like back off on volume it's probably the first thing that we look at and then and then we look at like range capacity probably i think people just maybe don't address what they need for their sport and they like kind of kind of grunt through it um for example like let's just speak on like for powerlifting generally you guys don't need a, like a bottom doubt dead ass into the bottom of the squat like weightlifters tend to do um, because it's just not part of your sport you don't need it so then what happens is like, yeah, I was tying my shoe and that's when I like blew my back out kind of thing. We were like, okay, well thinking about tying your shoe is like, it's bottoming out hip flexion. So maybe we just need to make it so that you have that range available so that not for your sport, but for your everyday so that you don't have to use your back into those positions nearly as much. Cause I mean, you're already loading it a lot in your sport or whatever, maybe like, it's just because your volume was bad and that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Like it was just too much, anything, too much of anything is exactly that, right? Too much. So I would look at that 
I think very long plyometric blocks, like if they're doing a lot of speed development stuff, like I don't, I don't think it could be done for like an eight week block. Like I think that you would just get a lot of really sore tendons if you did, if you ran a cycle that long, like tendons take a long time to heal and kind of build up new collagen fibrils and stuff like that. So if you're introducing some of those like plyometric movements, like box jumps and things like that, just to get faster, like, um, like faster squats or whatever the case may be, you just have to give the tendon some time. So I don't think you should run them for very long either. So being weary there and timing that with your training periodization is going to be really important, but that's more a coach's role. Mm-hmm. But if I, if I had a patient that was like, my tent, my like knees are fucked up. I can't do this anymore. And we look at a block and they've been doing box jumps for like eight weeks. I'm like, okay, well you're going heavy and slow for a while. Like we just need to make it just chill it out. Cause it's so, it's so loaded, right? Like that's the whole point of the tendons to store energy. And it's just, you, it can't do it for that long, that often. Right. And like runners, like you just got to look at their total mileage. Sometimes they're just running a lot. You have to back them off on their volume. Like whatever they're doing is they just can't tolerate it anymore. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed, like kind of as I become a little bit more experienced is like, I'm finding pain to be an actual, like a really useful indicator. Um, of programming for, for myself anyways. And even for yeah. my athletes sometimes, cause like, you know, and again, pain is obviously like kind of this broad spectrum. So I'm not like, Oh, you tore your bicep. I guess we need to back up. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not getting to that point, but when people are like, you know, Hey, I'm noticing I'm getting like a little bit worn down. It's not really like anything big, but you know, my shoulder just doesn't feel that great. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's look at that. You know? So yeah you're almost able to kind of get there before they actually start presenting with pain at the moment that I'm talking about, I guess it's just like, I don't know, something just feels off. And, and that's really it. It's just this like perception of something being wrong and sort of like, okay, cool. And then uh, I mean, like, I guess the most recent example was that was actually something that someone said to me and I looked at their program and all I did was I adjusted on one day, instead of having them bench to their chest, we made it to a two board. That's the only change I did just on one day. And then boom, by the end of the next week, they felt great again, no issues. Right. And so it doesn't have to be this like drastic change, but I find that that stuff can be really, really informative. And even like, if you do have an injury, sometimes it is, it is like, Hey, you know, what's actually going on. I mean, my hip pain that, you know, seeing you about, right. Where it's like, you know, why can't I get into these or, Oh no, maybe I didn't see about that. I saw you about the other groin. Anyways, yeah, it doesn't matter. But but like you know, you kind of have some pain, and it's like, well, when are you getting in pain? Well, I always get in pain once I reach a certain volume, like you were saying. But then I need to be able to get higher volumes or at least there before I can progress. And so it's kind of like sort of double-edged sword where you need a higher threshold of volume, but then when you do that, something's going on, something's being pushed too hard. And yeah. so then it's like, it, it kind of leaves clues a little bit to like, Hey, what do I need to do differently? You know, where am I kind of lacking in capacity or whatever it might be? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it can also be like a pretty cool indicator for like, you know, where you might need to, to double down and, and bolster up a little bit more resiliency in, in your athlete as well. The only thing that, that that's, it's just, it, it takes a long time for, I think an athlete to have the awareness really to know when something's yeah. feeling a little wonky, right? Like yeah. we're, we've been doing this for so long. So we know when something feels a little weird, but you have someone first year in where the first three months are always sore anyways. Cause like they went from zero to weight training and they don't know what kind of funky feels like. That's kind of sometimes our role as a clinician is just telling them that soreness is normal and it's safe and stiffness is safe. It's just, you, as long as you can warm up out of it, you're usually pretty good to go. If it's modifiable, pretty good. Like you can go, it's, it's fine. Or like shorten the range of motion for a while. Like see how it goes for a couple of weeks. Kind of like what you did. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't think it has to be 
that takes a very good coach. So that it speaks volumes on how, how good of a coach you are. Cause some people are like, just buck up and finish the thing. We'll change that the next block. But sometimes you need to make those changes in the program, like in that training block, you can't just tell them to tough through it until the end and then fix it later on. Like it's just not how the body works. It's telling you, it's giving you information and you can't ignore it. You have to, you have to do something now mm-hmm. or like at least put a pause on it. Don't progress anything. Just like give it time to accommodate change. It could be as simple as that too, but Mm-hmm. it's not always easy simple not easy like it's yeah yeah and i've definitely had clients who because like on on my on my check-in form or whatever uh every week one of the things that uh, that i have is like you know any additional comments or concerns and i make a video that i send to them like exp- like walking them through everything and like what i'm looking for in each section that they're filling out and so I talk about like, yeah, you know, like, is anything hurting or bugging you or whatever, whatever. And like the first week with one of my uh, new clients, this was quite a, quite a long time ago. Um, they were like, yeah, my back hurts. Like I, I injured my back. And I was like, what? You injured your back? Oh my God. And, and anyways, and so like, I'm reading this and I'm like, what the fuck happened? Like, and I'm looking at the program and I'm like, nothing seems to be out of place. Like it's like, I'm talking like one set of, of like exercises, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause, cause they were, they weren't sedentary, but they weren't necessarily used to training at a high intensity. So I was like, okay, you know, we're going to give them a bit of an intro block to kind of ramp them up over time. And so they had a very, very low volume and everything. And I was like, what the hell's going on? So anyways, I scheduled a call and, and they're like, yeah, you know, like I hurt my back and I was like, okay, what do you mean by hurt? Well, it's just really sore. And I'm like, what do you mean sore? And they're like, like my upper back. And I'm like, okay, what makes it hurt? And she's like, well, like if I reach forward, it just feels really stiff and tight. And I'm like, oh, you mean like you're, this is just muscle soreness. <laughs> like, yeah. and they, they had no idea. They had no idea. And I was just like, I was like, okay. And they're like, well, man, like, I don't know. This just seems really intense. And I'm like, have you never been sore before? And they're like, no, and this is someone who'd been training for like three years, you know? And I was like, okay, I guess you've never actually like really pushed or anything, you know? So it's, yeah, I don't know. Like differentiating like pain because that can be painful. Like if you're if you've never been sore and all of a sudden you're really yeah. sore, you're like, oh shit, sitting down is like a seven second process now, you know? Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's like there's definitely like gradations of, of discomfort. Oh yeah, and like we usually just say like like I, I have a lot of patients who are like it hurts in the morning. And a lot of times in the back of my head is like, yeah, same. Like, I don't, what do you expect? You're just kind of like going out of a position that you just were in a different one for eight hours, hopefully eight hours at least. And like, <laughs> it's just going to take some time to kind of like move out of it. But you have to like guide them to that realization that like, oh yeah, like it's normal for things to just kind of feel a little protective. In the meantime, you kind of like move out of it, let your brain wake up. It's just telling you to just like take it easy in the morning, really. What is that's all kind of is, and then mm-hmm. that you can modify it with just a cup of coffee sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> have a shower, have a coffee, and you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. Um, so we're coming up on that hour mark, and I want to be respectful of your time. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that maybe, you know, we didn't cover or maybe just kind of some final thoughts that you wanted to, to share with the audience? I, I think um, I always have this quote. It's uh, closed mouths don't get fed. And I think the if you talk to your coach, let them know kind of what's going on. They can either modify or whatever they need to do earlier on before pain gets worse. Or at least they could tell you to go see someone to kind of get a better look at it um, if they think that that's what it is. But you have to say something. I can't, I can't fathom how often people will go through it not realizing that if they just asked about it, they could really, really just tackle it much earlier on. You don't always – things will be sore like we talked about. You don't have to – be in pain like it's just not really doesn't it's not necessary unless um unless you like it but i don't know why anyone <laughs> would <laughs> yeah. no that's actually a really good point because i mean even i've got that 
from time to time where I'll be like, oh, like they'll tell me about something. And I'm like, oh, what? Like, how long has this been going on? And they're like three months. And I'm like, how am I just hearing about this now? And they're like, I just didn't want to bug you, you know, like you're doing a really right. great job. And I'm like, okay, but like, <laughs> that is my job. You know what I mean? Like yeah. either we can address it or if I can't, yeah, exactly. Like you said, we refer you out. We find someone who can actually handle it because you being in pain sucks. Right. And so it is literally sometimes just like, they just don't want to put you out, which is like the funniest thing, you know, sometimes. Um, it's weird. Yeah. Close mouth. Don't get fed. Yeah. Just say something, maybe not all the time. And like, if you're like day to day changes, but like for three months, pain for three months, like, Say yeah. something. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. Um, awesome, man. So where can people find you? Um, you can follow me on Instagram, Coach RSA, or you can um, book online at our website. Our website's dynamicyyc.com. It'll lead you to the booking site, and you could find us right across from MEC downtown. Well, find me right across from MEC downtown, 833 10th Avenue Southwest. Awesome. And that's in Calgary, Alberta, guys. And quick question, actually, do you do any online uh, treatments, assessments, anything like that? We tried to during the pandemic. Um, it's so slow and arduous that uh, it's just not something that I am, I guess, like, we just don't have the processes built out for it. I would rather re refer someone. I think, I think there's also like a pain relieving effect of just having your hands on someone too. Yeah. So like, they could just reassure you or feel stuff. I, so I'd rather find so a practitioner that I would trust mm -hmm. in uh, if you're not in Calgary, because there's a lot of great practitioners. You just need to know where to look. Right. Okay. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks so much for jumping on again. Uh, really, really interesting discussion and uh, all that stuff's going to be linked up in the show notes, guys. Make sure you give him a follow. If you are in Calgary and you uh, want a really good clinician, he's got, a ton of great people uh if for some reason you didn't like him or his haircut or something like that um <laughs> and yeah if you like the episode you like the podcast make sure you go give me a five-star review wherever people do that i don't exactly know where i'm like the worst at promoting my podcast if i'll be honest <laughs> but uh make sure you share it subscribe do all that fun stuff thanks so much guys i will uh, see you later